Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Sujan Reddy. Uh, I'm a vascular neurologist and a neurohospitalist at Mercy Hospital in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Hi there. I'm Nicole Gonzalez. I'm also a vascular neurologist and neurohospitalist at the University of Colorado. Um, and I'm also the co-director for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, today, Sujan and I are going to be summarizing the manuscript Safety and Efficacy of Tenecteplase in Older Patients with Large Vessel Occlusion, a Pooled Analysis of the Extend IA TNK Trials. And the first author on this manuscript was Dr. Yogendra Kumar. Um, in addition to talking about the study, we'll be talking a little bit about the limitations, implications of the data, and some next steps. So Sujan, why don't you tell us a little bit about the EXTEND IATNK trials as sort of background for this paper? Absolutely. So the EXTEND IATNK and TNK part two were uh, both multi-center randomized prospective clinical trials that were performed uh, from Australia and, uh, and uh, New Zealand. Uh, the first part uh, compared 0.25 milligrams per kilogram of TNK to the standard dose of TPA, which is 0.9 milligrams per kilogram. And the patient population they evaluated was patients with ischemic stroke and a larger occlusion who were eligible for thrombolysis uh, within four and a half hours and groin puncture within six hours. Uh, the second half of the study was extend IATNK part two, uh, wherein they compared the 0.25 milligrams per kilogram dose of TNK to the higher dose of 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. The reason they performed the part two study was during the recruitment phase of extend TNK part one, the results of NORTEST trial uh, were released and it showed that the higher dose uh, was probably safe in patients too. And that's why it's important uh, to evaluate the higher dose uh, when you compare it with 0.25 because these patients with large vessel occlusion have a high clot burden and you want to test if a higher dose would be more efficacious in recanalizing. So that was the reason why the authors performed a part two uh, of the extend IATNK. Now, coming down to uh, this current study that we'll be discussing today that Dr. Gonzalez mentioned, uh, this was a subgroup analysis, uh, pooled analysis from the first two uh, trials. The study subjects that the authors focused on was the octogenarian population, specifically older than 80 years of age. Uh, the intervention that was performed was comparison of the three uh, doses uh, of TNK 0.25, TNK 0.4, and TPA standard dose 0.9 milligrams per kilogram. Now, the rationale for the study is important to know because there has been uh, some literature in the past uh, highlighting that a higher dose of TNK could potentially be harmful in terms of intracranial hemorrhage. This is in the cardiac literature as well. Uh, where patients who were treated with 0.5 milligrams for uh, MIs were noted to have higher rates of intracranial hemorrhage. Now, there is equipoise because NORTIS trial showed that it was as safe and efficacious, the 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. And also going down to TPA, we know that there has been some hesitancy in the past, which has affected the European guidelines when you use uh, TPA in older patients more than 80 years of age. So there certainly was clinical equipoise when it comes to utilizing uh, these Two, two doses of TNK and the TPA of 0.9 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, so this is an important study which adds more data as to which dose and which medicine would be safer in this patient population. Uh, as far as outcomes that were assessed in the study, the authors evaluated 90-day MRS clinical outcomes. They've also evaluated freedom from disability, which is MRS of zero to one. And they've also evaluated mortality and symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. Now, how this is different from extend IATNK and TNK part two, which were the patent studies, is because in those two studies, the primary outcome that they used was primarily radiographic assessments of uh, recanalization. And the clinical outcomes were secondary outcomes. Uh, so now the results of this trial, of this uh, pooled analysis were quite interesting. So of the 502 patients that were enrolled in the two trials, there were 137 patients uh, that were beyond 80 years of age, so about 27% of the patients. And in this particular age group, when the authors compared the three, uh, the two doses of TNK and TPA, they noticed that the lower dose TNK, 0.25 milligrams per kilogram, was in fact associated with improved 90-day MRS when compared to 0.4 milligrams with an adjusted odds ratio of 2.7. 
and also when it was compared to T, uh, TPA of 0.9 milligrams per kilogram with an adjusted odds ratio of 2.28. Uh, notably, patients that were treated with a lower dose TNK also had lower rates of mortality in patients more than 80 years of age. So it's uh, it's interesting that this lower rate of mortality was attributed to uh, higher rates of intracranial hemorrhage in the other two groups. And uh, the way the authors came to this conclusion is because they had a pre-specified sensitivity analysis that they performed uh, excluding patients with SICH on mortality. And they saw that when they excluded patients with SICH, uh, the difference in mortality amongst the groups disappeared. So presumably the difference in mortality that was noted uh, that is a higher mortality in the TNK.4 and TPA groups was related to the SICH. Uh, so this was an interesting result. Now, as far as they also evaluated patients younger than 80 years of age, and there was no difference in any outcomes uh, in patients younger than 80 years of age. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, you know, octogenarians or patients more than 80 years of age 0.25 milligram per kilogram dose was safer and more efficacious in terms of reducing 90-day mortality and freedom from disability. And there was also higher rates of SICH, which led to more mortality in patients with a higher dose of TNK. So that's basically the summary of this pooled analysis. Yeah, that was a very excellent and succinct summary. Um, can you comment on some of the limitations of the study? Yes, I think when it comes to limitations, uh, this study was performed in Australia and New Zealand. And as we know that uh, in the United States, there, has, there are very few centers which are using TNK. So the metrics and eff efficacy of, or efficiency of using TNK is not as comfortable, I would say, for physicians in the US as compared to Australia. So certainly that adds limits a little bit of generalizability that even though it was a multi-center randomized study, it wasn't truly international because uh, they didn't have sites outside of Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the other important limitation that comes to mind when you look at the parent studies was this is not generalizable to patients with uh, other etiologies of stroke, like small vessel disease, because both the parent studies uh, included only patients with large vessel occlusion. Uh, so that kind of limits generalizability to uh, you know other all comers or other stroke etiology patients. And the main limitation, in my opinion, though, is the reason that they must have noticed the difference when it comes to improved outcomes between the lower dose TNK and higher dose TNK and TPA could have been related to uh, lower sample size and the fact that it wasn't adequately powered. Uh, because when you look at the angiographic outcomes in this pooled analysis and the final infarct core volumes, there wasn't much difference in the three groups. So there is no real true explanation as to why there was a difference between the outcomes in this study. Uh, so it could have been related to type one error and uh, to a low sample size. Yeah, I think the authors also mentioned that in the manuscript as well. One, one limitation that stands out for me is, um, you know, it, it's also a different healthcare system than the system we have here in the US. And so when we think about what all of the different pieces that have to fit together in order to get a patient to a good outcome, it's more than just what happens during the emergent setting. Um, it's what happens during their hospitalization, what rehab they have access to, what resources at home and support they have as well. And so just being confident and being able to translate those results, um, it, the generalizability is, is a bit of a limitation, as you mentioned. Absolutely. Uh, so, Nicole, what do you think the paper adds uh, in terms of uh, the current literature? I think that this information um, adds to the growing body of literature that informs, that is currently informing us about the safety and the efficacy of using TNK, um, and it is specifically in this case in patients who are elderly over the age of 80. Um, with large vessel occlusion who present within the four and a half hour window for symptom onset. I think it provides ongoing um, information about the dose that perhaps 0.25 mg per kilo is the dose that we should be sticking with. And so far we don't have accumulating data to support 0.4 uh, milligrams per kilo. Uh, I think those are the main things that stood out for me. Anything else you noticed? 
No, I think I agree, you know, with the prior studies showing some concern with the higher dose, although Nortis did not show this, uh, this at least in the octogenarian population, I agree this shows uh, or adds more, uh, sheds more light to the fact that probably a 0.25 milligram per dose is safer uh, in these, this particular age group of patients. Oh, you know, one more thing. Um, I think it provides, for, for me anyway, when I'm trying, you know, when you're consenting a patient for, for treatment and they're asking you, well, what are the chances that I'm going to do well or I'm going to respond? You know, the, the patients who are over 80 years old, we know generally they don't do as well as younger patients. But this, this data provides a little bit of quantification that families and patients might be seeking. And so we can tell them, you know, not everybody's going to do well. I think they said about a third of the patients who are over the age of 80 achieved um, the primary outcome. And so I think being able to say things like that to families and patients um, makes it easier for everybody to make decisions together. So I, I actually appreciate having that additional information for a specific patient population. Absolutely. And I think that's an important implication of this paper for clinicians too, when it comes to using the data from this paper in real world clinical practice. Uh, anything else that comes to mind in terms of implications for clinicians? Oh, yeah, I think there, there might be a, a few of those for me. I think the, the biggest one is it's a reminder for, um, for centers that are, have not yet made the transition to CNK, like, like myself, um, that we're getting a lot more data that TNK is um, certainly not inferior uh, to, to TPA. And so perhaps it is time for everybody to start getting ready to make the transition. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing was, you know, in the Extend IATNK trials, they did use CT perfusion, but they did not, you know, towards the end, they did not require a mismatch for enrollment into the trial. So what I think that says to the many centers who do not have access to CT perfusion is that you can get treatment started in this patient group. Um, and then make plans to, to ship them to a center that is endovascular capable. Um, so, you know, while it was part of the study, I don't think it, it's necessary um, to think about our patients if you don't have a CTP available. The other thing is, um, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard people trying to exclude elderly patients from thrombolysis because they're over the age of 80. And I think this is a reminder that, you know, our, our population is growing. It was 20, 27% of, of this group. That's a huge chunk of the patient population. And I think that that number is just going to increase uh, over time. And so age is not an exclusion to thrombolysis if the patient otherwise fits. So I thought this was a, a nice reminder for clinicians about that. Absolutely. I think the fact that they didn't have a bar on upper age limit and NIH as well uh, is certainly helpful. And that's probably what we should see more and more in the upcoming clinical trials. I think one thing that is dif difficult, you know, I think for me, it's always easy when I see that independent MR independent 90 year old patient MRS of zero, they're still driving doing the checkbook, living alone independently. It, it's easy for me to make that decision to, to go forward with aggressive treatment. But when, we, when I see a patient who's not so functional, who may not be ambulatory uh, at baseline, you know, this, this didn't give me any information about that patient population. And so I'll still be searching for what to do um, with those patients. Absolutely. So I think in summary, what, what do you think comes next uh, for this field or for this particular topic? Yeah, I think the authors call for additional research, which, you know, I don't think we're going to get a clinical trial of just 80, 90 year olds. But I do think that for clinical trialists, it is important to remember not to put that upper age limit in our clinical trials because we need this information um, for a growing aging population. Another thing is, um, interestingly, I didn't see race and ethnicity reported in, in this clinical trial or in the EXTEND IA TNK parts one and two. And as, uh, as a clinician who takes care of a very diverse patient 
population, I'm always looking to be able to tell my patients, you know, you're the kind of patient that has been studied. And for me, that provides additional reassurance for the patients and families that, you know, we looked at patients just like them. And so it speaks to me to generalizability. So if I can see that data in that, in that demo, um, 